A very warm welcome to the Swedish EU Presidency Conference on how media policy is affected by the developments and changes in the media and communication landscape. This is one of the very first Swedish Presidency Conferences, so we're still at something like dress rehearsal stage. Please forgive any small mishaps. But I think looking at the program, we can promise a quite delightful dress rehearsal. My name is Karin Svanberg Sjövall. I am, since a few months back, the State Secretary uh, to the Swedish Minister of Culture, who is also responsible for media and democracy policy. And I am very pleased with the high-level participation of keynote speakers and panelists today and tomorrow, and I really look forward to hearing interesting thoughts on stage. I also hope that they will trigger even more interesting discussions during the breaks, at the dinner tables tonight, and of course at breakfast and lunch tomorrow. I'd like to start by just offering you a little bit of practical information before introducing the first speakers. Um, and I would also like to mention that the conference is being filmed and it will be possible to watch afterwards. We will have in total three sessions today, including this opening session. The following session will focus on stock taking of recent EU tech regulation and the last one today on the future of media policy. It will be a long but exciting afternoon. Tomorrow, the program will start at 9.30 with two more specialized sessions, and one will focus on the changing roles of our national media authorities, and the following session on media literacy and the need for a well-informed public. And to finish off, we have asked the moderators to give some thoughts on what has been said. Before you head off tomorrow, there will also be a late lunch. If there is time, moderators will give the possibility to post questions or to give comments. And if you missed the opportunity to speak in one of the sessions, please don't hesitate to approach the relevant moderator during a break so that we can benefit from your thoughts in the final discussion between moderators tomorrow. We hope to end the last session today uh, that you have a good hour before the buses leave for tonight's dinner. And as this is Sweden, and we like to be punctual, you are expected to be ready to leave at seven o'clock sharp from the main entrance. So please be there in time so as to not risk being left behind. The bus ride going north to the University City of Uppsala will take approximately 30 minutes. And after dinner, buses will take us back here. The hotel bar will of course be open when we get back for all the urgent discussions that cannot wait until morning. On a very practical note then, uh, tomorrow you will also be asked to check out from the hotel before the conference starts. So please leave your bags and coats in the wardrobe out in the main foyer because they will not be allowed uh, into this room. And finally, before we start, there are two questions that I would like for you to keep in mind all throughout these two days. Firstly, how has recent changes in tech policy and regulation affected the media sector and media policy? And secondly, what should be the focus for an up-to-date media policy in 2023? And with those words, I would like to give the word um, to the Swedish Minister of Culture, Mrs. Palisa Lillestrand. Thank you, Karin. Uh, dear Vice President Jourova, if, if you are here yet, <laughs> dear participants and experts and national representatives, let me echo my State Secretary Karin Svanborg Sjöval in welcoming you to the, one of the first conferences actually in Sweden and in the Swedish EU Presidency. Since uh, last October, I have had the honor to hold the position as Minister for Culture. The, this portfolio entails many important issues, not at least media and democracy policy. Media policy is, as you are well aware of, about safeguarding and the fundamental rights of freedom of speech and freedom of expression. Free and pluralistic media is the heart of democracy. 
The Swedish presidency in the field of culture and media will, to put it short, be focusing on freedom. Media freedom, artistic freedom, freedom to create, and ways to contribute, contribute to a free Ukraine. We will work hard to bring these issues forward, not least in your own field, continuing the accomplished work but done by our Czech colleagues, of course, on the European Media Freedom Act. A lot is happening in the EU when it comes to media and tech regulation. I have already mentioned the European Media Freedom Act. Even though we have not planned to focus directly on the legal act during this conference, I hope that the themes uh, that will be discussed during these days can com contribute to further constructive thoughts. Many of you who are gathered here today are instrumental to this pro process, and I am sure that you will bring the dialogue and the discussions on this important act forward. There is also a lot happening recently in the field of tech regulation in the EU. I think that everyone has had to work hard to keep up actually with the new policy and the new regulation that is now starting to be in implemented. And we certainly need to discuss how the new initiatives will affect industry, regulators and public in practice. Our hope is that this conference will contribu contribute to greater understanding, not least when it comes to the growing tech sector and the traditional media companies and how they are affected by the new policies that are developing. I really and truly want to wish you fruitful and interesting discussions during these two days. And as Minister for Culture and responsible for all issues regarding cultural heritage, I am very happy that you will be visiting beautiful and historic Uppsala Castle tonight for what I am sure will be a lovely dinner. Thank you, welcome, and I hope you will have two really interesting days here. Thank you very much, Parissa. So the next item on the agenda is a video message from Commissioner Thierry Breton, who, among many other things, is responsible for matters related to the single market for digital services. Unfortunately, uh, Mr. Breton was not able to join us here in Stockholm, um, but we will, as I previously said, have the pleasure to hear a video message from him where he will give us a short overview of recent tech Regulation. Dear Minister, dear Vera, ladies and gentlemen, I would like to thank the Swedish Presidency for organizing this conference on how European tech regulation affects democratic discourse and media policy. This topic is very timely. As we get into 2023, it is a good moment to look back at uh, how far we have come in organizing our digital space and what remains to be achieved for our democracy and, of course, our rule of law. I'm confident we will do so thanks to Europe's leadership, anticipation and acceleration. Let's speak first of Europe's leadership. It is now a widely accepted fact that with the Digital Services Act and Digital Market Act, DMA, Europe has set a global standard for platforms regulation. This was not a given. We needed to uh, set the rules of the game uh, and organize uh, the digital space with clear rights, obligations and safeguards. We needed also to restore trust in uh, the digital space. It was a matter of survival for our democracies in the 21st century. And it is uh, natural that uh, Europe took the lead because Europe is the first single market in the free world. And, uh, or let's say the bigger one. And 2023 will be um, a very important year for the enforcement of the much-awaited uh, Digital Services Act and Digital Market Act. 
In short, platforms will not longer behave like they are too big to care. Very large online platforms and search engines have, of course, a responsibility to tackle online disinformation and other societal risks, even if their ownership changes. And thanks to the DSA, online services will have to take a greater responsibility in addressing illegal content. Alongside, the DMA will regulate large online platforms that act as gatekeepers between end users and business users, including media services. This brings me to uh, my second point on anticipation. My key message, be ready. Things are already starting to change on the ground as online platforms are anticipating the rules and uh, modifying their processes. Because no platform in the world can do without 450 million users. My services are also working closely with member states to support them in appointing their digital services coordinators. In order to uh, ensure that uh, the DSA yields results, it is absolutely crucial that these authorities are appointed in uh, due time and that uh, they have the necessary independence, expertise and resources to carry out, out their task. And of course, I encourage you to start this process without delay. The DSA and DMA package sets a comprehensive framework for the digital space. But we also need to help our citizens navigate this space and protect information as a public good. And this is an area where I see Europe accelerating and also delivering in 2023. To protect and empower our citizens in the modern media environment, the Audiovisual Media Services Directive requires video sharing platforms and member states to take measures to develop and promote media literacy skills. This kind of uh, know-how is essential for citizens to look at their sources of information critically and be able to detect false or misleading content. We'll make sure that video sharing platforms deliver on this obligation and uh, assess if they are taking appropriate actions. And soon we will have uh, an additional tool, the Media Freedom Act, uh, the missing uh, puzzle for the organization of our digital space. The Commission has highlighted worrying trends threatening the independence of media across the EU in its rule of law reports. With the MFA, the EU will have a single set of rules to reinforce editorial independence of media services across the single market, both uh, in the digital and more traditional environment. We'll bring more legal certainty for providers and users across the 27 member states, creating a real single market for media services. The Media Freedom Act will also play a preventive role. Often, we take our democracy, our independent media, for granted. We don't believe something is possible until it's too late. But let's face it, there is no country free from the risk to media. With this in mind, I look forward to uh, the conclusion of uh, successful negotiations between co-legislators this year in order to make uh, the Media Freedom Act a reality. I know that we, Vera and I, can count on the determination of the Swedish presidency to advance on this ambitious timeline. Because we share the commitment to improve the quality of democratic discourse, especially online. So I would like to, uh, to wish the best uh, of luck and success to the Swedish presidency, which comes at a defining moment for the EU. And uh, this being said, I would like to thank you all, all of you, and also to wish you a very, very fruitful discussion. Thank you very much, Commissioner Breton, for this message. Now, um, it is time, finally, for our keynote speakers. No more politicians on the stage for a while. Uh, and the first one that I'm very happy to introduce is Mr. Christophe Deloire, the Director General of Reporters Without Borders. 
Uh, your organization is really at the very forefront of the discussion of media freedom and the importance of news journalism. And for me, as someone who's dabbled a little bit in journalism myself, it will be very, very interesting to take part of your reflection this, in this time of change, but also of very big challenges for journalists around the globe. Please, the floor is yours. Thank you so much. Dear Minister, dear all, I have to start with an official statement. This speech is given by a human being in flesh and blood. It is not delegated to a machine. My text wasn't drafted by a, an artificial intelligence. And as a human being, I want to express my real pleasure to give this address in a country which is ranked third out of um, a third country out of uh, 180 countries in the World Press Freedom Index. It's a real pleasure. That's clearly something that uh, the OpenAI product GPT-3 could not say. The democratic challenge is today's topic. There are many democratic challenges, but one transcends all the others. The democratic challenge of the public space, of the public square. The founder of modern India, Nehru Gandhi, asked, what is press freedom? Is it the freedom of media owners to influence content with their money? Is it the freedom of journalists to write what they have in mind? Or is it the right of the public? This question is more crucial than ever, but we experience an accumulation of many other complex questions that Gandhi could not have figured out. Do we expect IA to comply with democratic principles? In case yes, which principles? How do we avoid that algorithms are the agents of private ministries of truth? The change of paradigm is so strong that we cannot just incorporate classical doctrines. Pluralism does not mean anything for Alexa or Siri. Private messaging systems are neither private nor public communication, they are both. What about those mixed spaces, etc., etc.? A lot of concepts seem like outdated, or at least the concrete implementation. What does responsibility and integrity mean for Elon Musk? Uh, here we have an answer, nothing. The problem is that the democracies have not clarified what the responsibilities of social media networks are or what appropriate sanctions on accounts are. What are the rights and duties of a social media account? This is a very complicated question. Those people, I mean the heads of platforms or shareholders, will continue to make arbitrary decisions if democracies do not specify very concrete safeguards. A first necessary step is to complement our set of concepts. We have the freedom of opinion and expression. And we have press freedom, which is balanced, balanced with the journalistic duties that have been established in history through media regulation, professionalization of journalism, methodology, and self-regulatory ethics. In an era of disintermediation, where clearly journalists, media outlets are just a part, and every day maybe a smaller part of the game, when everybody can be a media or pretend to be a media, there is a huge gap that we have to fill. We surely cannot extend the rules of journalism to everybody. This is not feasible, and would it be feasible? It wouldn't make sense. At the same time, having journalists being like a sort of museum in the jungle will, will lead to the destruction of trustworthiness of news and information. It is necessary to develop a concept around the right to information. The right to information, as defined in the International Declaration on Information and Democracy, consists of the freedom to seek, receive, and access 
reliable information. The right to reliable information is a right for everybody. This doctrine's move means that if you violate, uh, means that you violate a basic right of citizens and human beings if you disinform, manipulate, or spread rumors. This evolution of the doctrine is really important. It can be the basis for a new logic of legislation. The right to reliable information will allow for the development of responsibility in the new information space. It will help to set up and legitimize new legislations in front of propaganda. It should, could be added in our constitutions and be the basis of our laws. In order to implement the right to reliable information, we have to work at at least three levels. First level, the level of journalists, the level of press freedom, I would say. Defend journalists worthy of the name. Right now, there are 530 journalists behind bars to date. A sad record. In 2022, 57 journalists were killed which means that one journalist dies every week in the world for doing his or her job. We notice press freedom violations inside Europe itself. Second level, develop a media market that favors editor independence and sustainability and ethics. Third level, impose democratic safeguards in the information and communication space beyond journalism. That's broader than journalism. We have to connect the dots between press freedom, media policy, tech policy. They cannot be disconnected anymore. The EU aims at and starts demonstrating leadership, as Thierry Breton said, at those three levels. The list of European laws which were recently adopted or are underway is impressive. DSA, DMA, Data Act, IA Act, EMFA, European Media Freedom Act. Regarding the implementation of the DSA, which is an important move, I know, you know, we know that we cannot rely on the platforms for the assessment of the systemic risks. There is a need to at least assess the assessment and surely more. In order to reinforce the legitimacy of this regulation, the EU Commission will have to delegate some of its own responsibilities to independent bodies. It will be crucial in the future. The proposed EMFA is unprecedented too. Yet, it needs clarity on many provisions like the, on the ones to ensure editorial independence. On platforms responsibility, EMFA is a strong opportunity for much more ambition in the fight against disinformation through the promotion of trustworthy information. The union must come up with further responses consistent with the scale and gravity of the situation. Let me highlight three. First response, gather democracies so that they create a common democratic information space. We know that both tech companies and despotic regimes in very different ways want to impose a new world media order. In front of this, we need a multilateralism of democracies. The Partnership on Information and Democracy, initiated by Reporters Without Borders, has now been endorsed by 50 countries on all continents, including 25 member states of the European Union. Sweden is one of the signatory countries, and we would welcome if Sweden would play a bigger role in this effort. We hope that the new government will amplify its engagement. The civil society-led implementation body of the partnership, the Forum on Information and Democracy, has drafted hundreds of concrete recommendations for policy frameworks about tech companies. Dozens of those recommendations from the forum have inspired the EU Code of Practice Against Disinformation. Hundreds of other existing recommendations could clearly fill the gaps of the DSA and the Code of Practice. Further obligations are needed in the fields of transparency of algorithms, private messaging systems, and pluralism of algorithms. Principles for responsibility regimes for social media networks and their users have to be imposed by democracies to platforms. Ideas are available on the table. There is also a need for external audits 
of tech services. We need for the information chaos the equivalent of what the IPCC is for climate change. The plans for the Observatory on Information and Democracy are available. We have promising discussions with the OECD, but the EU should sustain this effort too. We call on the EU to use the expertise now built, built up by the Forum on Information and Democracy and take full advantage of this new multilateralism. A multilateralism that connects governments with the civil society, which is a key for uh, the legitimacy of decisions. And clearly, the European Union can play a bigger leadership role in this effort. Second response. response. Make compulsory mechanisms to promote reliable sources of information. Algorithms promote sensationalism, lies, hatred, etc. Beliefs prevail over facts, over facts. It's urgent to reverse this logic, which unfairly disadvantages quality journalism. There is no integrity factor in the algorithmic indexation. Trustworthiness is not a criteria at all. It is essential to oblige platforms to promote reliable information sources, not just to promise that they will do, but to take very concrete commitments that uh, can be assessed. We've made a huge progress with a market solution which is non-discretionary, which is scalable, which is European. It is called the Journalism Trust Initiative, JTI. With stakeholders from all over the world, we, develop, we developed an, an ISO-type standard about journalism under the aegis of the European Standardization Committee in order to verify compliance the certification market is now available. As we are here in Sweden, I have to mention that we did work with Swedish stakeholders. TT News was part of the standardization process. Svenska Dagbladet entered the JTI process. What we have to achieve is that digital platforms, advertisers, philanthropists, public funders provide incentives to certified media outlets. We have made progress in this field too. The Journalism Trust Initiative, JTI, is mentioned uh, in the EMFA proposal, and the reference to JTI has been included in the EU Code of Practice against disinformation as a trust indicator. But for the moment, if we have a concrete look, only one platform committed in this Code of Practice to work on amplifying reliable sources of information, just one. Uh, that's Microsoft. Microsoft. The reluctance of other one other ones prove that a voluntary commitment is not enough. The EU should move to enforcement. The MFA, especially its Article 17, is an important opportunity for that. European standard, but universal reach. 50% of the first 500 media entered into the JTI process come from the global south. JTI can be used as a criteria for the allocation of development aid earmarked for the media. We are having discussions with development agencies, and we will be delighted to discuss it with the Swedish International Development Agency, SIDA, dear to us. Third response. Establish a system for the European information, uh, a system of protection for the European information space. We need to address the asymmetries between open and closed countries. The current globalization of information and communication space does give a competitive advantage to despotic regimes in front of democracies. Concretely, Russian disinformation before and during the war in Ukraine prompted the EU to impose urgent sanctions. It is now essential for the EU to put in place an appropriate and sustainable legal framework for such decisions. RSF, Reporters Without Borders, proposes a system for the protection of democratic information spaces which would include a reciprocity mechanism. It would be implemented by independent regulatory bodies and would be more legitimate than economic sanctions. We recommend that the MFA, in its Article 16, should include such a system to protect the European information space. The President of the European Commission announced that it would introduce a defense of democracy package 
in the second semester, it will be another opportunity. So as a conclusion, I don't know if Vera Jourova did enter the room, uh, but we are very grateful. I will uh, uh, say it later to her uh, for her efforts on uh, tenacity. In such times, it's difficult for a lot of stakeholders to realize the change of paradigm. A lot of industries would prefer business as usual, but business as usual, vis vision as usual, regulation as usual, solutions as usual, in a fully new context, would destroy journalism and beyond journalism, democracy. We need a new deal. We count on uh, Vera Jourova and others. We count on Sweden. We count on Europe. Thank you. Thank you. Christophe Deloire. Uh, thank you very much for this thought-provoking intervention. Um, let me now turn to our next speaker. I am very happy to welcome uh, Mrs. Silla Benke. Uh, Silla Benke is the Director General of Swedish Radio, one of the three Swedish public service companies dedicated to radio broadcasting and pod services. She is also part of the EBU Executive Board and has for a long time been internationally engaged. I know that Silla uh, is to be also deeply engaged in questions that relate to all of the topics that are up here today, such as the continued and important role for traditional public service companies in a new and digital world. Silla, please. Thank you, Karin. Hi, everybody. Good to be here. It is the 9th of February last year here in Stockholm. The restrictions due to the pandemic had just been lifted. There is a feeling of relief and relaxation in the air. We were heading for better times. We thought how wrong we all were. Just a couple of weeks later, at four in the morning, President Putin decided to invade Ukraine. And since then, we have a historical war going on in Europe, close to our borders. Six minutes past four, my company, the Swedish Radio, started a 48-hour long broadcast and we got half a million new listeners in a country of 10 million people. This tells me that strong and independent media is always important, but in the time of crisis, more important than ever. Therefore, the things we are here to talk about today, EU regulations affecting media and media freedom, is of course of crucial importance. Thank you very much for the opportunity you have given me to talk about the subject that I have devoted my entire adult life to and that I think is absolutely essential for a well-functioning democracy. This conference is taking place at a time of rapid and profound changes in our world. A rather dark picture emerged. There is completely new and a very dramatic security situation in Europe that will affect all of us for a very long time to come. A situation that has fundamentally also affected media and the communication landscape. And I will divide my speech into three parts. First, the new landscape. The Russian attack on Ukraine in February last year has redrawn the security policy map in Europe for a very long time to come. In Ukraine, thousands and thousands have died on the battlefield, in the cities, in their beds when a bomb hit their house. The supply of water and electricity has been demolished. Hospitals have been bombed. Many roads have been destroyed. And there are few glimmers of light right now, at least if you ask me. We're also in the midst, at the same time, of the biggest assault on truth and on democracy since many, many decades. The invasion has led to both personal tragedies and threats to independent journalism. The Russian Duma has criminalized factual reporting, the Russian military has shelled broadcasting towers in Kyiv, and the Kremlin has blocked access to trustworthy and independent media. I've been a member of the European Broadcasting Union's executive board for many years. The discussions inside the board, the topics that we have to deal with, are often very complex and very new. Currently, one of our focuses is on how we can support one of our members so that they can actually be able to distribute their journalism, protect their employees, and find ways to get their content out when the regular broadcasting opportunities have been bombed to dust by one of the world's great powers. Since last summer, my colleague, Mikla, is also a fellow member of the same executive board. Mikla, he is the director general of the Ukraine public service company called UAP. 
PBC. Some meetings he is participating via teams from a bomb shelter. His reporters run up and down from some of the same shelters to be able to report safely. This is what everyday life looked like for Mikola, for his employees, and for millions of Ukrainians. Shelters have become a necessity. In the new communication landscape, we must have a plan on how do we actually create a secure and robust digital infrastructure. We must learn from what is now happening in Ukraine. At the same time, there is another war going on that affects many of us, the hybrid war. It's not a war on the battlefield. It's not a war with bombs. The modern hybrid warfare has left the battlefield and has often moved into cyberspace. Hybrid warfare is cheap, and there's a large toolbox to pick from. You can find digital and social media platforms used by states or by groups with the aim to weaken or to destabilize nations, state security, individuals or companies. Hybrid warfare is, of course, also a threat against media organizations. Media is often a key target in a hybrid warfare. The reason is very simple. Anyone who succeeds in devaluating trust in independent media has an easier time influencing a country from the outside. When the truth is no longer there, part of a society's foundation actually disappears. Perfect tools for a hybrid warfare are disinformation and misinformation. As a consequence of the war in Ukraine, the world economy has also been subjected to severe pressure. Governments are trying to deal with rapidly rising inflation, and interest rates are at sharply higher levels than before. And on top of that, we also face an energy crisis. In this new landscape, we see how democracies around the world are being challenged. In a study from the University of Gothenburg, it is stated that the number of democracies in the world has not been so small since the end of the 80s, when the communism collapsed in Europe. Today, strong leaders in many countries are screwing down the democratic foundations systematically. And the researchers at the University of Gothenburg calculated that there are only 32 pure liberal democracies in the entire world right now. Only 13% of the world's population actually lives in a liberal democracy. How these challenges facing the global community that I have just mentioned will affect the world's democracies remains to be seen. What we know for sure is that in many countries, authoritarian leaders use crises to advance their positions and to reduce freedom. We saw this not at least during COVID. And this leads me to the next part of my speech, which is, of course, the new media landscape. The challenges for public service and other media in the new communication landscape are enormous. We deal with them on an everyday basis. In Sweden, we currently have a very strong dual system. And that is strong and independent public service side by side with a wide range of successful commercial media. And that is a system that I'm very proud of and that I hope we will all protect in a media world that today is much, much more global and much, much more digital. If we cannot guarantee media freedom, if we cannot guarantee our opportunities to operate independently, it does not actually matter if we succeed in our technical developments, nor if we are successful in attracting the right employees, for instance, or innovating new attractive content. Threats to free media to public services increases in time of unrest. Security policy changes in parallel with a depressed world economy constitute a dangerous basis for further restrictions of media freedom. And therefore, it is very important right now that we are very attentive in the coming months and in the coming years. Reporters Without Borders annual press freedom index that you heard that Christophe mentioned shows a very, very worrying trend. Several EU member states have plumped down the list, an undeniable consequence of sweeping restrictions to media freedom. Of course, these countries often dismiss these claims. They say that the outside world is biased, independent voices that raise the alarm are merely tools 
manipulated for political gain. And none of that is true, of course, but nevertheless, the narrative is very, very effective. It is an effective way of silencing the critics and dismissing calls for necessary reforms to strengthen rather than to restrict media freedom. It is easy to understand why authoritarian regimes want media to be loyal. It gives them control. It gives them control over the flow of news, and it is a way to silence difficult questions. It is a way of avoiding accountability. We also live in times when the political discussions has increasingly come to be about how reality is actually described rather than about one's own vision, one's own political ideals, or one's own ideology. When journalism confronts these descriptions of reality, media often end up in the firing line. In the populist narrative that has become more and more common, journalism is the bad guy. Free and independent media are singled out as part of the elite, as part of the liberal establishment, in opposition to the rest of the society, as serving their own interests, or as tools for people who want to do harm to their own nation. You have all heard this, you have all read it, and I think you have all met it. By repeating these messages, both in Europe and across the Atlantic, populists actually try to devaluate journalism, to undermine its function as an independent force vital to democratic life. And this leads me to the last part of my speech, which is the importance of protection. In my role as a director general of the Swedish Radio and as a member of the executive board of the EBU, I often take an active role in discussions on freedom of the press, public service, and the wider role in a democracy, both in Sweden and throughout Europe. And I have to admit, sometimes it feels like preaching to the choir. Everyone seems to agree. Very few politicians openly say that they want to dismantle or weaken media freedom. But the truth is this. Attacks on media freedom are becoming more widespread in countries all across Europe. So what can legislators in Europe then do to prevent the development where more and more countries are moving towards an authoritarian development and where the freedom of the media can no longer be taken for granted? Well, it's actually a number of things. Because big changes often start with very small steps. And this is why it is important to take a close look at the debate at both the national and the international level when worrying signals start to arrive. Restrictions on freedom is more difficult in the light from public exposure. At the European level, there have been some initiatives that are very promising when it comes to protecting media freedom. I do really appreciate the initiative, for instance, behind the European Media Freedom Act. The ambition from the European Commission to protect independence, pluralism and transparency in the European media landscape is extraordinary. But it took long before the EU started to act when countries within the Union attacked the freedom of the press. And at the same time, I have to say, I'm concerned that things that work fine at the national level are now at risk of being regulated at the European level. Swedish media freedom is part of a constitutional law that dates back several hundred years. We have a very well-functioning system with independent public service media that have long broadcasting licenses, a proper distance from the politics, an extremely high level of trust and reach. Now, a European board for media services is to be established with, if you ask me, unclear powers, unclear scope, an unclear mandate and independence. And of course, there are extensive risks with such a system. In addition, what does the phrase adequately funded public service media in the EMFA actually mean? Even public service media with a significantly changed scope can be adequately funded based on a new mission. What protection has then actually been created? And don't get me wrong now, I do appreciate that it is stated that public service is important and that we need sufficient money. 
All I'm saying is be aware on how this is now being used. It is important to be careful and to search the balancing point in the forthcoming work with the EMFA and to define and omit from the proposal the areas within the field that are best to be regulated nationally. When it comes to the Digital Service Act and the Digital Markets Act, there are only so also a lot of good intentions behind them. However, they do not resolve all the problems that public service companies encounter in the digital landscape. I'm actually not so sure that the online platform providers will stop to remove or to meddle with the content or services from public service. In most cases, the possibilities that the DSA establishes will not be adequate for many of the members of the European Broadcasting Union. It is also important to mention that the DSA doesn't fully open up the black box of the recommendation systems. For me, it is important to encourage the decision makers now in the forthcoming legislative process to further strengthen media providers' rights. There are good reasons for member states to take measures to ensure prominence of material of general interest when it comes to audio as well as video. The need for national regulations in this area will most likely increase in a more digitalized and heterogeneous media landscape. It is easy otherwise to see a development where content of general interest is given a less significant place in various searches when presenting material or in interfaces that meet the consumer. Also public service media, you have to remember, lack the bargaining power to insist on inclusion on such platforms and findability and prominence of their services. So, we do live in challenging times. One thing I am absolutely convinced of is that the access to free and independent media has never been more important. The role independent media play in a democracy is crucial. Preserving and strengthening that is everyone's responsibility. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Sila. I am now very, very happy to be able to welcome our next uh, keynote speaker, Katie Harbath. Kate is a former public policy director at Facebook, and she is deeply engaged in issues that relate to how social media is affecting the democratic discourse and what the regulative changes in the US and the EU bring about for platform services and for the media sector. Please, Katie, the floor is yours. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for the invitation to the Swedish government um, and for all of you for giving your time and attention today while I talk about an issue that has been very important and near and dear to my heart. Um, I spent 10 years at Facebook where I was on the public policy team and built the teams that work with politicians and governments online, how to use the platform, as well as coordinating the company's work on elections from 2013 to 2019. It's need needless to say, I learned a lot during that time. There's a lot of lessons that I think that we can learn from that, and that is where I've been spending and dedicating my time since leaving Facebook in March of 2021 and what I want to talk a little bit about today. I want to talk first a little bit of how we got here. I think the history of technology and politics is really important to look back on and to learn some of the lessons of the things we missed in the rise of these platforms as we think about this next chapter in technological innovation. I wanna talk a little bit about what I see as the current state of play of where things are, as well as what I think we can expect in 2023 and beyond. So first, how did we get here? So my first job was in 2004, actually started in 2003, at the Republican National Committee. I was a communications assistant and actually ended up being a part of the e-campaign, which is what we called it back then, of thinking about how the party could use online tools in order to engage with voters and get our message out. And the start of that period and the next 15 years, in my mind, was a real optimistic time period for the internet. We thought the internet was going to be the great democratizer. Our goal was we thought it would be amazing to have world leaders and the president of the United States engaging with voters one-to-one -one or one-to-many. We've had the Arab Spring happen in 2011, Barack Obama's campaign in 2012. 
we truly thought that the internet was going to be a force for good in this world. Then came 2016. A key date in this history is May 9th, 2016. Two things happened that day. One, it was the Philippines election with the rise of Rudy, Rodrigo Duterte. And it was the day that the trending topics controversy broke for Facebook, which is where a contractor accused the company of suppressing conservative content in its trending topics field. A month later, Brexit happened. And then in November of 2016, the world was turned upside down by the shocking victory of President Trump. We entered into a reckoning stage. What had we missed? The first story coming out of the November 2016 election was not of foreign interference, but of Macedonian teenagers pushing fake news to get clicks, of questions around online advertising and how much more transparency we needed with those. And then we did have the question of what the Russians had done in that election, as well as the Brexit election and many others. The Cambridge Analytica scandal came in March of 2018. All sorts of questions and grappling that the platforms were dealing with, as well as society as a whole. In 2018, we started to see regulation introduced. As was mentioned earlier, e the EU has definitely been a leader in this space. I'm not just introducing it, but you all have actually passed some, <laughs> unlike my friends over in America. <laughs> And we're starting to see, and that debate continues today. But now, starting last year, I believe we've entered a new phase. I haven't quite figured out what to call it yet. My first gut is to call it decentralization. We are seeing massive changes in the online environment right now, where you have people going less to just some, a few big platforms, to using a lot of different platforms. There's a lot of different ways that people are using and communicating with one another. It is changing rapidly. And I firmly believe that two years from now, the online environment will look very different than it does today. And as you're thinking about the regulatory environment and the work that you're doing, it's important to be thinking about also where things are going and making sure we're not just solving for the problems of the past. So the current state of play. There's 11 things that I've been really seeing happen right now that I will go through quickly because I only have 15 minutes, but happy to talk about more later. I talked about the legacy platform struggling. Rise of TikTok has taken away a lot of users from Facebook and uh, Instagram, YouTube, others. These newer platforms are also, you have in America and other places, more far-right platforms that are coming on board. You're seeing people use messaging services more, which was talked about earlier by Christoph. These are really important places to look and make sure we're paying attention to because they oftentimes don't have the resources nor will to do some of the efforts that the bigger platforms have done. We've seen a lot more collaboration between government platforms and civil society. We saw this in the Brazilian election last year with the efforts that the TSC have done. The code of practice against disinformation, I think, is another amazing one to look at. Same thing in America. However, that collaboration is now bringing up questions. It's starting right now in America, but I think it will spread. Of what is the appropriate role of government, of encouraging platforms to take um, certain measures on online speech? I think that this will continue to grow and be criticized and looked at, especially as regulation starts to get implemented. We have the government regulation that was here in Europe, but wasn't in America. And I'll talk a little bit about America later, but I do think that this is going to be leading us into a time and place where we are going to start to have very disparate and different um, forms of regulation that is going to be very hard for platforms to implement around the world. And more work will be need to be done to streamline these and figure out how we can make them all work together. We saw the, um, the ability to pre-bunk uh, that was very effective in trying to combat mis- and disinformation. We saw that work somewhat well with the Russian invasion to Ukraine, but also with the US 22 midterms. People are becoming more um, critical consumers of news. They're more aware of these issues that might be happening online, and that's something that we should take into account. Content creators continue to be an important force. Influencers, people who are not traditional journalists, and others who are spreading this information um, 
this information, not disinformation, on it that we really need to pay attention to and the platforms continue to compete with of having them on their platforms. And politicians are working more with these influencers. There have been stories from the Washington Post, and we've seen the Biden administration invite TikTok influencers to the White House to brief them on the efforts that they're doing. There's little transparency into those relationships, particularly if any of them are paid. We are seeing more campaigns move from doing advertising on social platforms to streaming platforms. Those streaming platforms don't have ad transparency. It's a little gnaw my <laughs> After all, we did it at other platforms for doing that. I think it's important that we need to look at where some of this advertising and efforts going, and do they have the same transparency efforts or not. We're seeing changes in how platforms are approaching their newsfeed. Facebook last year very much talked about how they were going to show people more content from unconnected sources. TikTok's algorithm works by showing you things you're interested in, not necessarily the accounts you've chosen to follow. This is going to bring up more questions about how the, metro, um, the types of inputs that the uh, platforms are choosing when developing these algorithms to show you content. The rise of AI is growing rapidly and quickly and is going to be one of the most fat. You think the problems we're dealing with right now around ethics and content moderation are hard? AI is going to be even harder. And finally, I think last year was the year of trust and safety. You now have, over the last year and a half or so, so many more people that have worked inside these platforms that aren't anymore. They either left on their own volition or they've been laid off. These are people, one of the groups I work with, the Integrity Institute, which I admit some of you may work with, is a membership organization where we have over 100 members of people who still work at or worked at companies that are trying to open source more of this work. They're trying to work with people like you to better bridge that gap between how the tech companies think about this and how policymakers and regulators might think about this. And I highly encourage you, if you go to their website, integrityinstitute.org, and their uh, resources section, we have more there. It was mentioned earlier, and I just want to repeat it, but democracy is at its lowest level since the 80s, with much of that decline happening in the last 10 years. Now, is the online environment and social media the only reason for this? No, but it's certainly a big one. And we need to start thinking about as we're investing money, not just in democracy building, but how do we prevent democracy backsliding? And that may require us to do work and partnerships with different organizations um, and countries than we may have done in the past. By the way, this data is from VDEM, which is one of the more um, leading organizations that measures democracy. But there's some good news in this, too. Pew Research did a study at the end of last year that showed that most people think social media has been a good force for democracy in their countries. While we're doing this work, let us not forget there's good parts to this too. And while we definitely need to be spending this time to figure out how we mitigate the bad to make up for those 15 years of optimism, I truly believe we'll get to a place where we're mitigating the good and amplifying, sorry, mitigating the bad and amplifying the good. Wow. <laughs> Can I blame that on jet lag? I'm going to blame that on jet lag. <laughs> We also need to remember that some of the, these platforms that don't get as much scrutiny necessarily are also very popular. YouTube is one of those that still remains at the very top of people's lists. The rise of TikTok. More people under 30 are starting to get their news and information from TikTok. We may not like it, but it's a reality, and we need to pay attention to it. I mentioned the rise of far-right media, and we'll make these slides available so you guys, <laughs> I know a lot of you are taking pictures and stuff too. But we need to pay attention to some of these smaller ones. They may not have big user bases, but it is where we saw, at least in the US midterms, Russians and others trying to target some of these users to try to help sow um, chaos and more polarization. I mentioned the ri this rise of streaming. I just want to me mention it again. I think this is very important to look at, not only in terms of what campaigns are doing, but again, of how people are getting their news and info. So what can we expect? Again, I'm going to go through this quick because the hook is slowly starting to come up on the stage. <laughs> the increased questions around the um, relationship between, between tech companies and governments, for sure. In the US, you're going to see dueling congressional hearings. We've got the House GOP leading the House. We've got the Stems leading the Senate. They're going to be having hearings on these issues. I don't think we'll see regulation in this Congress, but I think it'll be important to look at. We will continue to see the rise of the right online media. 
Not just online, but also use of podcasts, traditional radio, other things that we need to pay attention to. Rumble, a site that just paid Donald Trump Jr. many millions of dollars for a podcast. The campaign online strategies are shifting. Talk to the digital practitioners who are building these ad campaigns, who are doing social media. Ask them where they are seeing the users go to. Where are they seeing the most return on investment? Pay attention to AI. I was talking to a friend yesterday, and I was, we were talking about how 2025 is going to look so different. And he works in AI, and he goes, it's going to be AI. It's going to change everything, and we don't quite know exactly how, but it's going to. This is another US-focused one, but I think it's important. In the US, the judiciary is starting to enter the chat. Next month, the Supreme Court's going to hear two cases um, around these issues. They are contemplating a third. And there is a very decent chance that we could see conflicting rulings come out of these court cases that could severely hamper how platforms are able actually to do content moderation on their sites. It brings up important questions about recommendation algorithms, but we really need to be careful and make sure we're thinking through the unintended consequences of some of these um, rulings or regulation we might put into place. And finally, there are major elections this year that are going to preview what we might see in 2024. And this is my final point I want to leave you with. Next year is the first time ever, I did the math, that the world will see not only a US presidential election, but elections in India, Indonesia, Ukraine, Taiwan, Mexico, likely the Europe, United Kingdom, and the European Parliament. That has never happened before, and not only is it a huge geopolitical moment, but this is a lot of fronts on, with countries that approach the online environment in very different ways that not only the tech companies have to tackle with, but so do everyone in this room, the media, civil society, and others. We need to start now and make sure we're not just thinking about this year, but thinking about next year as well in the tsunami of elections that are coming. Thank you so much for giving me the time. Um, I write about these issues on my newsletter if you want to sign up, like everybody else who has a newsletter these days, or you can follow me on social media. Thank you so much. <laughs>
your democratic traditions and practices give Sweden a unique authority to be a leading force in the EU when it comes to this debate about democracy and rule of law. It explains why whenever we start the discussion, uh, there are always several states with long-lasting democratic tradition, which are very vigilant about what the Commission is going to propose, because there is always this message, do not decrease our standards. We are no, not going to sacrifice our standards because there are other member states who are not there yet. So, uh, uh, I have to say at the beginning that whatever we do, and it also applies to the Media Freedom Act, uh, we do not want to touch the systems uh, which work well and which uh, uh, should serve as good practice for, for others, rather than something to be dismantled in the name of common, common Europe. And definitely we need to do more to protect democracy and, and freedom of speech and, and rule of law because uh, several years ago we still lived in a strange illusion that uh, it's perpetuum mobile, that we do not need to do anything, that that's the end of history. And uh, gradually we saw uh, uh, the challenges and, and problems piling up, not only in, in the Eastern and uh, uh, Central European countries, but, but uh, almost all over Europe. Uh, so we uh, realized that we have to uh, deploy some more mechanisms and safeguards in common Europe, not to see dismantling of democratic system and not to see the, the autocratic uh, systems and the autocrats to, to gain the power. And uh, what we see in some member states uh, um, that there is always the same menu of the enemies of uh, the autocrats who believe that uh, through the elections, still democratic elections, the winner takes it all. It's always the same pattern. Uh, independent judge is becoming the enemy. Academic freedoms and freedom of speech. Uh, uh, independent and strong media. Professional state administration. And last but not least, active citizens. We sometimes hear from democratically elected uh, members of different parliaments that for the citizens it's, it's enough to come once in four years to cast the vote or to establish a political party. And we say, of course not. We want the people to be demanding every day and ask their governments and parliaments, what are you doing there? And uh, to keep the, the, those in power under control and to enjoy the, I will say it, service of independent, strong and trustworthy media, because these are in interconnected uh, 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 chains or values uh, which we would like to see in democratic, uh, uh, in democratic country. Uh, you, Kathleen, Kathleen? <laughs> You, you were so energetic, I was afraid at the back that I will not be able to continue. Um, uh, you, you spoke about the impact of the social media and, and internet and uh, artificial intelligence, thank you for that. Of course, I, I have to say that whatever we do in Europe, uh, which also differs us from United States, uh, we are doing it uh, with a double, double aim. We want to promote digitalization and technologies which serve the people. We want to invest in it. Otherwise, we will not be globally competitive. But at the same time, we are determined to, uh, to filter out the risks and to, to address the risks by, by the legislation. That's why we adopted the Digital Services Act uh, and the Code of Practice Against Disinformation. So when uh, we discussed the Media Freedom Act. Uh, it's good to uh, read it together with those two other pieces of, of our work because uh, we are going through a very daring exercise that we want to uh, make fairer and safer information space without killing the freedom of speech. Is it possible? I, I believe it is. But we have to be extremely careful. 
not to uh, create the space, again, for the autocrats to use in the future the European rules uh, for, uh, so produced with good intentions for bad purposes. And uh, I lived half of my life in, uh, in uh, communist Czechoslovakia. I remember my father who used to tell me, Veruska, do not believe anything you read. There was absolutely no, there were no media and there was of course no, no uh, freedom of speech. Now my message is, please do not believe everything uh, you need, yeah. It, it is it is a similar a similar story, but uh, uh, we will have to do everything, uh, not only to adopt the legislation. And I will come to the media law in a minute. Uh, yes, I know the coffee is waiting, <laughs> but uh, not to open the space for any kind of censorship. I spoke to Helen Tornik Schmidt from uh, the Facebook board, and she told me 90% of the requests to moderate the content, to remove the content from Facebook, is coming from the governments. It must not work like that, because, oh, it, it works like that, but I can imagine that from the governments the requests are about the content, which is something they don't like, because they are critical of the government. Is it disinformation? Every content which is uncomfortable for me as a politician, I am convinced not at all. So uh, we must uh, not uh, launch some era of content moderation uh, slash censorship. Also the use of AI in content moderation. Uh, we are not very explicit about that in, in our uh, legislation in the Digital Services Act and in the Code of Practice, but uh, uh, we know that the platforms are using artificial intelligence for detecting the, the pieces of disinformation and more than that, the illegal content, which is uh, hate speech, uh, which is uh, child pornography and which is terrorism and extremism. And uh, my uh, response is probably you have to use this technology, but at the end of the day, there must be a human being who will look into that, whether this is really hate speech, whether it's not covered by the freedom of speech. Here comes the case from the last week in Lithuania. Facebook uh, removed uh, the content produced by the people who were expressing their views on, on the war in Ukraine, because there were some bad words, which in the Lithuanian context uh, meant something else than uh, for somebody who just get the, gets the words translated. And I asked Nick, like, could you please invest more in hiring the people who understand the sensitivities of the language? Because not all the... All, all the messages which look like hate speech are hate speech. There, there is a very rich case law in every member state. So, I, what I want to tell you uh, that the Commission and I myself, we are very careful not to open the space for censorship and we will be um, uh, implementing and enforcing the Digital Services Act and the Code of Practice with full responsibility because we have, as the Commission, the role in it. But at the same time, we, we will be also looking at whether the platforms are not overshooting. Because it might happen that being under sanction, they will try to please us. They will never please me if they remove the content which is not comfortable, which is, is not nice, but which uh, uh, deserves the protection of the freedom, freedom of speech. Last comment on artificial intelligence. I, as a lawyer, am convinced that they can use the AI for detecting and removing the production of artif artificial intelligence. So I speak about the bots, about the fake accounts, about everything which is not the production of the real people. Because in good old legal traditions in the EU, we are protecting the right to speak of real persons. 
So, um, I will close this, this chapter on disinformation by saying that by the end of, of uh, January we will get the first uh, load of the data from the signatories of the Code of Practice against disinformation. I have big expectations and we have to work well with the data because we don't know still how disinformation impacts the society and it might differ state by state. So we will get the data and for the first time I will give it to the researchers, to the sociologists, to the security experts and they should read through the data and give us the message. Is it serious? Uh, should we do more? Or should we, and now pay attention, should we trust more European society that the people themselves will become more and more resilient and stronger and stronger and be able to uh, face the, the, the uh, attacks uh, through the disinformation and be able of better and more critical thinking. Because this is what I hear in the United States. You in Europe do not trust your people. You want to regulate the speech. I don't believe it's, it's the truth. But uh, we have... Ex very, very bad experience in Europe. Last century was full of it. Just imagine if Mengele or Stalin would have had social media. The war would be quicker, maybe with a different result, I don't know. Just imagine if, if uh, oh, Mengele, Mengele uh, should have, if he would have had the AI for identification, who is the the right race, who has the right to survive. But uh, coming to the Media, Media Freedom Act, of course, in uh, that uh, information uh, battle, and now we are in the information war with, with Russia or against Russia since 2014, we see more and more how media, strong, trustworthy media uh, are important. And... Uh, we, that's why, not, not because of the war, but because uh, uh, we see the negative trend, uh, we decided to propose the, the Media Freedom Act. Uh, we uh, do not want to destroy what works well, what I said at the beginning. That's why we take the uh, Scandinavian systems, uh, the German system as some kind of benchmark, especially when it comes to the safeguards of independence of media, but also of the media boards. Uh, we decided to uh, propose uh, the common rules um, uh, for, for the EU because we believe uh, there is the legal basis and there is a pan-European need to strengthen the protection, protection of media. Uh, because I speak too long, I will not go into details, but I wanted to <laughs> react on what Madame, uh, Madame Director sp spoke about. So, so, so just a few words. Why we included media, uh, public service media, for strong reason, because we would like to have public service media, not party media or state media, so public service media better protected in each member state. Uh, no, I, I will not go into, into details, uh, but uh, uh, rather uh, I will make a general comment. Uh, the Media Freedom Act is at the beginning of the process. Uh, we detected the willingness of the member states to support the law. Uh, when, uh, I think it was in December, the, the Cult uh, Cultural uh, Council. Uh, we have, I think, five recent opinions from, from five member states. Uh, the, the objections are, it's not a European thing. We have good system, system good enough, so do not touch it. Uh, you don't have the legal competence, uh, you overshoot it because uh, we expected directive and not regulation. I Believe me, I knew why I proposed regulation, because we do not want to see gold plating and creative work with uh, the, the EU directive at the level of the member states, uh, when we have some bad, bad experience. 
Uh, so, uh, uh, but but more or less the reaction of the member states was was positive. Uh, I know the objections of the member states, but mainly of the professional bodies and professional uh, organizations. And I am ready to work on the Media Freedom Act so that the final product will address maybe better the real problems and without over-regulating the things which may not uh, be necessary or which might open that dangerous path for those who might, might want to um, abuse it. At the level of the European Parliament, uh, there, are, uh, there will be three committees uh, involved. Uh, prob probably the leading committee will be Kult Committee, with uh, probably a German uh, rapporteur, Madame Freheyen, uh, who I spoke to several times. Um, there, there will be IMCO Committee, because the legal basis is the single market, and this is the domain of the IMCO Committee, plus uh, the Libe Committee as the committee which, which is uh, focusing on the on the fundamental rights and, and freedoms. Um, and we expect that also the media will uh, do something to increase the trust in the society, uh, because we see that one of the negative trends is, is the decreasing, decreasing trust. Uh, we believe that some self-regulatory measures might be very useful. And I think that this is, uh, there is a broad space for, for cooperation. I skipped many, many important things. And I added a lot of others, <laughs> because I don't see your annoyed faces who desperately need the coffee. <laughs> but you were very patient, and I felt there are some positive vibrations. Let's cooperate on a, on a good thing for Europe and for Sweden. Thank you very much. Thank you.